Hey everybody, my name is Rachel. I'm a member and organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation in Boston. I'm here today with two fellow organizers in the PSL, Gabby from mm-hmm. Philly. Give it up for Philly. Hey. Philly. <laughs> Mia from New York City. And you know, this week we are honoring Lenin in what is a hundred years after his passing in 1924. And we just really want to have a conversation about Lenin, about mm. Leninism, right? Because you know, as we're in the streets right now for Palestine, as more and more young people are turning to socialism as the mm-hmm. answer to some of these crises that we are experiencing under capitalism in the United States and across the world, it is so important that even 100 years plus after Lenin's passing, that we need to understand how important his contributions were to mm. the movement. Let's get into it a little bit. Yeah. Of all the organizations that you could have joined, you decided to join the PSL. Tell us why. Word. So I joined the party right at the end of my senior year of college. And this was in 2019. And for me, I had already been involved in student organizing. Mm -hmm. My school was very, you know, caught up about just like changing the world and like mm. using science and technology to like solve all these big problems mm. that are that are like that working people are confronted with like climate change like debt you know studying politics and this and that and it just was always really strange to me how all these brilliant people could be working on solving these world problems but we still have homelessness mm, like right. we still have you know like flooding natural disasters we still have just racism Mm -hmm. and police brutality you know like sexism like all these issues are still prevalent and if not getting worse Mm -hmm. so for me when i met you know it's kind of like i knew a friend who had like seen a tweet somewhere and it was like all right cool like these people are like they they seem like they're talking about cool stuff and i started going to events and I was like, okay, these people are really down. Like mm. the comrades that I met, the organizers, they were all very serious, very disciplined, mm. and just outside. Like it wasn't mm. just like, okay, we're all talking and like on social media, it's, mm. you know, <laughs> right? We're sitting in a little room and like talking about how smart we are and how good our ideas are. But it's like we're actually in the streets with working class people in the hood. Like I know that's right. Yeah, <laughs> like that was yeah. So. That's really what drew me to the party. Mm. And, you know, I had, since I grew up in the black church, I feel like I had a very strong affinity to like collective spaces and collectivities. Mm. Like I grew up in an environment where people, you know, brought each other food. Mm. They like helped each other repair, you know, their plumbing in their house or, you know, you have an issue in your community. It's like, you can go to this minister or this person, this church member in the congregation and like work through things. Mm. And so I think that really drew me, but at the same time, the politics were not there. Like there were a lot of parts of growing up in the church that I was like the homophobia, like the, some of the institutions were just really tied up in like, I don't know, just keeping things the way they are Mm. as opposed to like, okay, Jesus was a revolutionary, right? Mm -hmm. Like I feel like, and Palestinian, (laughs) right? Like he was flipping over like the, you know, tables or whatever and like, cussing out tax collectors maybe not cussing them out but like i feel like that's the kind of energy that i was looking for and it was actually the socialists that had that energy Mm -hmm. and so that's where i like that's where i felt comfortable pretty much so yeah (laughs) the long and short of it what about you mia well i joined the party when i had reached like a i think i had reached like a pretty good level of understanding different types of organizations. I feel like people sometimes enter politics and they don't really know that there are different types of organizations. Mm -hmm. They're just like, oh, you know, I like this issue or I like these people. And I joined knowing like, oh, I want this kind of organization. Mm. Because all of the PSL members that I had ever met were not only like the most disciplined and most optimistic and most like down to do whatever was needed to do, but just like the most humble, Mm -hmm. understood that everybody was valuable in the movement. Comrades were never proselytizing, like, hey, this is why this is the, you know, this is the best, blah, blah, in like coalition spaces. And that was just like so admirable to me. And then above all, like my mom is, 
like, came to the U.S. from the Vietnam War. And so mm -hmm. I, like, grew up with my conception of, like, what is being progressive and what is being left is, like, always tied to this thing because it was, like, real in my life every day. And understanding that like, global politics right. was key. Like, I could never just sit and be like, oh, I'm going to be, like, a good, like, Asian American or whatever, and, like, that's going to solve all my problems. Like, mm -hmm. that was never going to solve any of my problems. And the PSL was coming out for, like, you know, countries that I didn't even know about and had, like, a no, strong facts, facts. line. You know, like, before I even knew about the war in Libya, like, anything, the Iraq war, like, mm -hmm. everything, and had, like, people, and you could just, like, look at pictures of the, the rallies from the, since the PSL started, and it was, like, people of all, like, races and sectors of society were, like, I have a hard, like, I have a hard political line about this thing, and it is for the liberation of people around the world, mm -hmm. and just seeing that and being, like, well, these people were trained in this formation, like, I want to be like that, I want to mm -hmm. do that, um, I want to be a part of a group that doesn't forget about people around the world who are not in the imperial core, who are people who are literally like born in the dirt and like mm -hmm. have to toil and struggle every day. And I want to be a part of a party in the U.S. who doesn't forget about those people. Oh, right. That's right. No, period. I I agree with that. I mean, I feel like honestly, my story feels <laughs> like a combination of these <laughs> things. I was also doing student organizing in college. And it was at the time that there was a black student uprising on campuses mm -hmm. around the country. I don't know if y'all remember it, Mizzou, mm -hmm. of Missouri mm -hmm. or something. And the football team in response to police killings and to racism generally, uh, just like took a knee and was like, we're not playing. Mm. Um, and it really sparked off black student movements um, around the country. Mm -hmm. And being at a predominantly white institution, I was like, hell yeah, we can get involved <laughs> in this. And that kind of took its spin got involved in some housing organizing, police, anti-police brutality organizing, um, and all of the issues that I've, I really deeply care about because mm. they're very personal issues, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we all know someone who's been lost to mm. police violence, mm -hmm. to, to having been evicted, like, you know, mm. I mean, at least speaking personally. And so I was doing all this work. Honestly, I was freaking tired because mm -hmm. I was running myself into the ground, mm. trying to find other people who just like felt as committed to the issue. Mm -hmm. But also I couldn't be everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like, that. <laughs> it's like I can't be leading this and leading that mm -hmm. and leading this mm -hmm. and all these struggles that are so separate. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you got to be in the housing org. Right. You got to be in the, the BLM yeah. org. Right. You got to be in the... You know, climate is, group right. and there's no merging of any of these issues and I just remember I've been around the PSL for a while and I remember at one of these protests it was my first protest mm -hmm. I heard a comrade a member of the PSL get up on the mic and just say everything I needed mm. to hear I literally went and found him on Facebook <laughs> I was like man what you said was so good it touched mm. me in a way that I've never understood yeah. all of these things coming together i was like i need to i need to figure out how i can get involved in this mm. and it took me a while to come around but i was I, ultimately i was like every issue no yeah. matter what it was i'm like oh look who it is emceeing who's 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 calling this demo who's speaking on the mic and speaking the most facts mm -hmm. it's it was <laughs> members of the psl it was just a consistent thread and also I think it's interesting because when I was on campus, maybe y'all might have experienced this. You, there's always those little socialism tables, and it's like yeah. white dudes. And I'm like, I, this has nothing to do with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, th this is not for me. Mm -hmm. But seeing the PSL just like in all of these different struggles, it was people who look like me. Mm -hmm. It was women. Mm -hmm. It was queer people. Mm -hmm. You know, like all these things that I feel like you know, maybe I didn't feel as represented in these, in the way that we were taught about socialism, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, and was like, damn, I got to get involved in this. And also on the, the international thing, I mean, my family immigrated from Haiti and it's mm. like, we know our, our people around the globe are struggling in so many ways, subject to so much instability. Mm -hmm. And what is our duty? I mean, I, it took me a while to understand because <laughs> I wasn't like, oh, we got to build revolution here in the United States. Mm -hmm. But... Lenin taught me mm -hmm. <laughs> that we need to build revolution wherever we are, but in the United States mm -hmm. in order to win liberation of our people, right? right? No matter right. Where, where they're at. And 
honestly, I'm grateful. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm grateful. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, everybody who I admire, I mean, I admire all my comrades so deeply, but some of my, like, leaders who I'm like, man, I want to be like that. And it's not even people, like, you learn leadership is so many different things. It's not even people, like, always on the mic, but people who I just, like, salute to every day when I wake up are, like, some of the women comrades that I have in mm -hmm. the party are just, like, so strong and hard and admirable and just mm -hmm. like damn I want to be like that and I'm so proud to be in an organization with those people I feel like you know we're talking about Lenin and in, in 2024 damn it's 2024 right. but right. <laughs> and like the struggle for Palestine is like on fire right now in the US in like a good way people are coming out more consistently and for longer than than I've ever seen for Palestine Lenin has so much relevancy for people like us whose families come from like the periphery, like the, the third world who like people who struggle and are under the boot of US imperialism every day in like such a real sense that, you know, people, working class people in the US are also under the boot of US imperialism, mm -hmm. but like, you know, like my mom or like even my, my dad's family, like my, I'm half Japanese, and I just think about, like, the the U.S. bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, mm. and it's just, like, that is so... That's crazy. Disgraceful. Yeah, it is. We're just, like, it's oh, disgusting. that happened. Yeah. yeah. Like, that yeah. And the and legacy. The war, like, it was, like, it was purely mm -hmm. almost experimental, like, yeah. the way that they bombed Hiroshima mm -hmm. and Nagasaki. It's, like, they it, the war was over, mm -hmm. you know, and they just decided, like, we're going to level mm -hmm. two cities Cities that we didn't bomb before because mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure we could observe, like, mm -hmm. the effects of these crazy bombs. And now we see what they're doing to yeah. Hazza right now. Like, it's just crazy. And it's, like, that, like, incident, which is, like, such a huge thing, I think, for if anybody of, like, Japanese descent, that's, like, a big thing. Mm. But it's, like, that's in the legacy of Lenin and this struggle because mm. they dropped that bomb, not because it would win the war, but because they wanted to signal to the Soviet Union, like, this is what's going to happen mm. if you try to right. liberate Europe, if you try to keep liberating, you know, the colonies, this is what we're going to do to you. And we're not afraid to kill civilians for mm. that. But like, for me to, to like embrace liberation and to embrace like what it really means to be like a person of my like lineage and descendancy, it's like, I'm going to become U the U.S.'s worst fear. I'm going to mm. become right. that socialist. Oh, right. I'm going to become that communist who's going to say, like, you can't, I'm not going to be afraid of this. You right. can level a city, you can destroy my people, but we will resist, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be the legacy of that. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Period. Yes. What's going on? Yes. Like, Joe Biden. Watch <laughs> out. Yeah, and I, I really feel that and resonate with what y'all are saying. Because, like, for me, being black in the United States, it's like, why would I, like, I'm looking for the organization that is going to, like, take the steps to end racism. Mm -hmm. right. And that, like, racism is a cornerstone of U.S. capitalism, right? Like, mm -hmm. you can't, U.S. capitalism feeds off of white supremacy. It relies mm -hmm. on white supremacy. That's why they're funding Israel so in the way that they are. It's why they're, you know, that's just why there's racism here <laughs> like it's like it's yeah. necessary to divide our class and then conquer us and so for me it's like okay well how do we actually get rid of this mm -hmm. like what what is it really going to take to end racism right because mm -hmm. if you study history it's not like for all of human history people have just been living like barbarians you know <laughs> right. like just suffering and like bombing and killing mm -hmm. each other indiscriminately and like this is all a development right mm. so when you actually understand that history like Lenin teaches us to study <laughs> then you can apply those lessons of struggle and like overcoming all those different you know issues that are happening mm -hmm. um overcoming the oppression the exploitation the you know ruling class, like oppression, all that stuff. So Leninism and specifically being in the PSL is is a strategic question. It's mm. like, how am I as a black person in America, as a black woman, going to actually contribute <laughs> to mm. like the liberation of my people in, mm. in real concrete terms? And that's not something that I can just do 
in in an idealistic way mm -hmm. just like I'm just you know thinking to myself like hmm like what am I gonna do to like right. stop racism <laughs> it's like yo like I actually have to link up with other people mm -hmm. like I have to go be with other black people with other organizers with folks who have defeated racism mm -hmm. folks who've defeated apartheid who've defeated you know the the feudalist state the, the slaveocracy all of these different mm -hmm. manifestations of class society and so again Leninism like the USSR that's the first example of the workers actually taking power mm -hmm. over their society and being able to actually you know improve literacy rates mm -hmm. like improve life expectancy mm -hmm. like have women women's suffrage like equality <laughs> of women in the government you know all these different things so yeah Leninism and the party I'm like yeah as a black person as a woman mm -hmm. if you're really serious about doing something to like improve <laughs> our <laughs> lives you know like let's study the people who've done it mm, before right let's learn we don't just talk about we're not just like romanticizing lenin because mm -hmm. we want to it's like that man led a revolution mm -hmm. right and not only did he lead a revolution the revolution won yeah mm -hmm. and it set up the first worker state mm -hmm. right in world history mm -hmm. that's no light thing god you know? Hats off to Lenin. But also I think about I think about like the images of Lenin like in those national congresses, in those like common turn meetings and like saying and that's when you know it's like it's not a paternalistic thing. Like mm -hmm. Lenin really understood that the liberation of the colonies was gonna be the forefront of world revolution. Right. I think, you know, in my own experience as a young organizer, I was all, I mean, similarly, I'm like, black liberation, like, right. black liberation. I was all about it in a very, like, you know, kind of an aesthetic way, almost. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, as a young person, I didn't necessarily read that much theory, you know? I didn't really, I'm like, what this got to do, to, do with me? Mm. But ultimately <laughs> uh i've come around <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think it's important in talking about lenin how important it is that as organizers we study theory we know mm. theory because theory is really just the distillation of experience mm -hmm. through practice um and it's funny i joined the psl not fully understanding what a socialist party a revolutionary party was and i just remember the first time i read lenin and honestly lenin is so misunderstood mm. right mm -hmm. like because he's writing about over 100 years ago yeah in a russian context mm. he's writing in the middle of struggle you yeah know? he's writing about his experiences um and it's very easy and also it was in russian right it's like translated. yeah translated um and it's so easy to like misinterpret what he's saying mm -hmm. and so the first time i read lenin bro <laughs> i'm grateful that it was in it, it was collectively done mm -hmm. with other comrades because i think people love to get and read lenin and be like oh i saw <laughs> yeah whatever. like i know exactly what he was saying mm -hmm. whatever and it's like no you don't and i mm -hmm. feel like most people who do that usually are not even organizing Literally. like they're not in the streets they're not Literally. you know talking to people doing outreach mm -hmm. having meetings like you know just, like there's a, all these strategic questions that people aren't having but like mm -hmm. oh yeah you can read lenin out of context right. and all of a sudden you're just you just have the answers uh -huh. exactly if it was that easy it's then why crazy. wouldn't we have socialism already that's literally, <laughs> insane. That's what you think, literally but so i was the first time i read lenin with comrades i read left-wing communism and mm. when i tell you that, <laughs> that book changed my life I one like, one lenin is so freaking smart yeah. <laughs> so yeah smart. but also this man is saying exactly what i needed to hear he mm. was saying just how possible it is for working class people and peasants mm. on you because the peasants was such a large population in russia at the mm -hmm. time which isn't necessarily the case here in the united states today right, but right. he showed us that working class people can in fact take power mm. of our situation and run society mm -hmm. you know like and not only that but he also taught us just how to actually do that, you mm -hmm. know? And it's through an organization that's disciplined and that has the model of the professional revolutionary. And I want to break that down a little bit because mm. 
what even is a professional revolutionary? For one, it's like you're committing yourself, you're subjecting yourself to a level of discipline to make shit happen. Yeah. You know, like we are up against the most powerful enemy mm-hmm. ever. <laughs> right. Like the United States is so its power is so entrenched mm-hmm. globally. Mm-hmm. It's hilarious to think that we can turn that we can just spontaneously just, like get up uh, and like everyone just one day is gonna be like you know what that a little group of us in, in our little community out here in boston is just gonna or wherever it is in Philly, yeah York, it's just gonna take down the most powerful entity mm. in the world no sorry that's wrong like you're wrong <laughs> and so he taught us in that book that that's ex- you need a you need a, a party right an organization that Underst- made up of, of, of members of organizers who understand this context mm-hmm. and understand just how important it is to shed your ego yeah. because people mm, Uh-oh. don't even get me just started. Get shed ego. Just no, please, off. get started. Get started. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm actually not sorry. You're right. Yeah, like, <laughs> this decentralized, like we just need to decentralize and we just need non hierarchical. Like, What'd you say? Non-hierarchical. Yeah, non-hierarchical. The non-hierarchical girlies. <laughs> whatever. I tell you to read Tyranny of Structuralist Men. <laughs> also changed my life. But th- what, what are we getting done? Mm. Who's making decisions? Who's telling it? Like, <laughs> at the end of the day, also, it's important to note that when you're in, like, a little decentralized, horizontal org, people are going to still rise up to the occasion right. and anyway. So it's like, let's elect our leaders. Right. Let's have a democratic process of how right. we engage with our membership, with each other, mm. and how we put our uh, the things that we're doing into practice and test them. Right. Because we're just doing a bunch of stuff <laughs> everywhere. And then we're like, oh, well. It didn't work because obviously it didn't work. <laughs> like, we don't know what part didn't work because mm-hmm. we weren't doing one strategy right. all, all cohesively and then testing it, assessing it, whatever. And so it's like, oh, all that to say <laughs> is like, we need an organization that we're all shedding our ego and saying, boom, mm-hmm. let's get this done. I mean, and people don't understand, I think, also when you read Lenin. And when you read it with comrades and in struggle, because that's really the only way to read Lenin. Yeah, you let's really be real. Just, yeah, you can't just sit down. No like, armchair social. No, no, no. Because no. you're not going to understand it. And like, I feel like we can all attest to the fact that like when you read theory, like yeah, you can understand it when you read, but when you have to, when you're at that rally and you have to make that decision, mm-hmm. or when you mm-hmm. are like, what you know, what new committees are we going to build, or like, what decision do I have to make for you know this campaign we're on, like, mm-hmm. that's when the theory really clicks. Because you're like, damn, I have to think about the forces. Just mm-hmm. like Lenin, I have to make certain decisions with my comrades, just like Lenin. I have to try and hold, like, the political line that I think is important, just like Lenin. And that's when you're like, damn, I wish I could. I wish I had that Lenin in my pocket right now mm-hmm. so I could consult. <laughs> because, like, you, you really don't... Your pocket, Lenin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you really, that's like when theory meets practice mm-hmm. and that's when you really solidify your political education. And, you know, I think that we have a hard time understanding history in general in this country, but Mm -hmm. they don't understand that, like, the Leninist party formation came out through struggle. Like, Mm -hmm. he didn't just say, like, oh, you know, I I sat at my desk last night and I drew this thing out. It was like, no. (laughs) The Second International betrayed the international working class, and this is why I think the party should be in this structure, Mm -hmm. which is a super simplification of it, but, like, it's true, like, those things come out through struggle, and if you don't engage in struggle in an organization, then you can't make those contributions, and we need people to make contributions. Mm-hmm. Like, we need people to join organizations. We need more young people to get involved. I mean, in New York, at least, the Palestine organizing has, like, like taken off in such a way because people are engaged, they're coming to meetings, mm-hmm. they're like interested in organizations they're following sort of like different leadership and they're saying wow i'm really i want to be engaged in the long run and that is like the party is like not it's a culmination of all the members but it's also when you come together and work collectively it becomes like its own force Mm -hmm. and that is like so exciting to be a part of because you really see like damn like it doesn't there's not that many of us and we can do a lot. We did yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. That we did. <laughs> and if the masses are behind us, 
we can do anything. Right. Yeah. Put that on a shirt. <laughs> Put that on a shirt. The I mean, that's another thing that Lennon taught us, right? Is that you can't just be up and theorizing in your room, as you mm-hmm. said. You have to be out there and know mm-hmm. the people. You need to yeah. be organizing amongst people to understand our context. Because as we mentioned, right? Like Lennon was writing in a context mm-hmm. of Russia. Mm-hmm. Like, fe- like basically feudalist Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, and... That's clearly very different than being in the most powerful empire, mm. capitalist empire to ever exist in the face of the planet, in the <laughs> United States. Right. Um, and you need to know the people. You need to, you need to be amongst the people and understand where people are coming at, where where their struggles are, what their struggles are, mm-hmm. how they think about them, how mm-hmm. they think about international politics, how they think about the news that they get on CNN every mm. day. Because we know people know that. <laughs> That shit is a joke, but... Right. Yeah, I feel like it's, like, to your point, it's, like, in knowing the people, there's, like, Lennon teaches us through his work and his writings that it's not just about seeing workers um, and thinking that, you know, we can just give people ideas or we can Mm -hmm, give mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. socialism or we can give people the answer. Like, we're not giving Mm -hmm. anybody anything (laughs) as members of the party. Like, we are, we are building with our class Mm -hmm. and we're observing, you know, we're observing the situation, observing the history, understanding Mm -hmm. the trends over time, the theory Mm -hmm. and applying that in real time. And I feel like, okay, I have two questions. I have two points. The first (laughs) point is I feel like there's this, there's this, there's a certain accountability that mm. comes with the Leninist formation that I feel like mm-hmm. a lot of organizers today are afraid of. Mm-hmm. Like people are afraid of being held accountable for their shit. Mm-hmm. It's like, look, if you say that you're going to do X, Y, and Z, and we decide on this collectively, like this is the path, then you need to follow through and do <laughs> yeah, the thing. Right. right. But when we have organizations that are decentralized mm. and there's no leadership and there's no like structure mm. then people can just do whatever they want and mm. no one is getting checked mm, right. and some people actually do need to be checked like you <laughs> can't just be running around and everybody's talking and nobody is actually mm. being challenged right? right i feel like a lot of people are they want to be agreed with mm. they want to be validated and affirmed and it's like that's cute that's great and all but in the context of like trying to fight imperialism and build socialism, it's not just about feeling good, right? Mm-hmm. It's about, and it's not even just about being right mm-hmm. or having the best idea. It's mm-hmm. about how do you actually apply mm-hmm. correct ideas to mm-hmm. a situation and a mm-hmm. condition to push the work forward, to push mm-hmm. the movement and the struggle mm-hmm. forward. So I feel like that's one thing. I don't know if you have thoughts on that. But the other <laughs> thing is... You were spitting. That was mm. my thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is I'm curious if y'all feel like, can a person really understand Lenin without being in a Marxist-Leninist party? No. Like, oh, d- period. Okay. Because <laughs> like one thing that I was thinking about is like, okay, maybe I feel like the best you could get if you're like reading Lenin with other people who are like serious and in good faith, like trying to understand Lenin and you're maybe organizing, but not necessarily in a revolutionary space. I just feel like those two things would lead you to want to be in the party. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I'm like, Rachel, you answer pretty quick. (laughs) It's like, I feel like that most often applies to people who aren't doing anything, who aren't Uh, aren't struggling. Like mm -hmm. what? I don't know. I don't know. I just, no. That's my answer. <laughs> well, I feel like I feel like something that we always talk about in the party, which is like one of the things that makes me so proud to be in the PSL is like you we understand that like when it comes time for revolution, we are not leading the revolution. Right. Like the people are going to make the revolution. Mm-hmm. And if anything, like we're going to be catching up with the mm-hmm. masses as they, you know, develop consciousness, you know, overnight and like that's the thing about democratic centralism. Like one of the key tenets of being a Marxist Leninist party is like when October 7th happened in New York, we called an action the next day. Yeah. You know, we didn't have to call the leadership to make a decision, to write a statement. It'd take like a week. Right. And that's that essential. Already passed. Yeah. The moments passed. And like, that's essential. Not because we want to be like, Oh, you know, like the PSL was right, whatever, even though 
whatever. I mean, history we were. will tell you. <laughs> yeah. like, <laughs> the people were out there. They were like, who's coming out here? Yeah. Like, w this happened yesterday. You guys are already late. Like, yeah. where where is everybody? And people swarmed the streets. And that's because the people know in their hearts, like, what the right thing is. Mm -hmm. And if you're not a, an, a party that can adapt to where the people are going and where they're at and what their conditions are, then you have no you have no way of being in touch with them. Mm -hmm. And like we saw that with, with COVID, we saw that with the George Floyd uprising and with Palestine now, like a democratic centralist party can pivot and meet the people where they're at, which is like the essence of organizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like democratic centralism for me is like, it just, it, first of all, it strengthens the organizing so much because I, it, for me, it breeds trust. Mm. I feel like democratic centralism for me has been foundational to the trust that I have in my comrades mm. and in the party. Because mm -hmm. it's like, I know if I have feelings about something, if I don't like the way something is happening, I'm going to just tell people, like, mm. why were you late for this? Like, <laughs> why, well, like, you know, like, why are we, you know, why are we doing X, Y, why are we, you know, setting up this event in this way instead of mm. this way? Why are we having these speakers? Like, mm. where's the visuals? What's mm. going on with X, Y, like, where's the communication? You mm -hmm. said you're going to be here at this time with these materials and you didn't do that. What mm. happened? And I can raise those questions, whether it's a political question of like, why aren't we organizing around this issue or mm. that issue? Um, and then I know, like, we're going to have a discussion. Like, I can talk to the leadership. I can talk to my comrades. And then when we do come to a decision collectively, like I said before, I'm, I've been raised in a very collectivist culture. Mm -hmm. So I am, I already understand there's so much more we can accomplish when we work together, mm -hmm. right? Like, there's a proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I feel like that is kind of an ethos that I had before I joined the party. But mm -hmm. like, after being in like a political revolutionary Marxist Leninist space, it's like, okay, we're we're going together. We're building unity with mm. so much intention that once we've had this debate discussion, there's disagreements, what have you. When we make a decision collectively, I trust that me and all my comrades will carry it out mm -hmm. to the best of our ability. Mm -hmm. And that I just feel like, you know, I was at the demonstration in D.C., mm. 400,000 people hundreds of comrades all around. I can tell you I've never felt safer. Mm. I'm like, if anything happens, everybody who I'm with is on the <laughs> same page, right? Like, mm -hmm. we're going to be with the masses. We're going to be with the people. Stay together, X, Y, and Z. So I just feel like, yeah, democratic centralism to me has really just allowed me to feel very confident mm -hmm. in making mistakes, raising mm. my voice and my opinion, and then just carrying out the work that I need to do to the best of my ability, knowing that if I mess up, if I do something wrong, I will be checked too. Mm -hmm. Like someone will actually let me know so that I can be a better organizer, be a better comrade, be a better human being mm -hmm. overall, right? Being able to accept feedback and like grow from that. So I just feel like there's like the there's so the the, the political sphere is very mm. pri is primary like being in the, mm. as a party member and at the same time there's just like a gen a general trust in like mm. both comrades and our class because mm -hmm. the media loves to make us afraid of each other mm -hmm. like the news is always showing all these violent images mm. oh these demonstrations peaceful protesting this and that and it's like. Well, if you're actually outside, <laughs> you will see that it is the workers and not mm. the police who are actually the most, right. you know, kind and generous mm. and protective and secure, right? The police are the ones who are inciting all the violence. They're mm. the ones that start gassing people. They're the ones that start arresting people, that start pushing people, mm -hmm. bullying and all of that. So, yeah, I just, <laughs> a lot of points there, but I just feel like democratic centralism is the wave. <laughs> <laughs> <Them's> that. <laughs> I feel like this is such a good conversation because... Like, democratic centralism is something that nobody ever teaches us about. It's a really important tool, and which is basically just like diversity of ideas. So understanding that you can have democratic debate and discussion and disagreement amongst your comrades. Mm -hmm. But when it comes time to act and when it comes time for a decision to be made and carried out, you have to move with unity. And that's like the key to not only like carrying out 
really effective organizing that we've seen, at least like I've seen in New York, a number of instances where that's like essential and, and making decisions on the fly with trusted leadership that everybody has elected mm -hmm. is essential. But also like, you know, I've been thinking about the, the Soviet Union and the Russian Revolution the past week, like a lot and thinking about how you like defend mm -hmm. the things that you've won. And that's something that I feel like a lot of people in the US and for like, you know, for a good reason, like don't think about and don't and can't imagine because we haven't had many of those revolutionary movements where you have to say, okay, we need to, not only have we won today, but tomorrow is even harder because we have to defend against our enemy. And in the US, we have a formidable enemy mm -hmm. who is going to be able to, you know, dismantle us, take us apart, destroy us if we're not centralized. It's like the whole Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. It's like there was a massive movement, a feminist movement, and once that died down, the right wing came back with their attack. Mm -hmm. right. And so if we do want to defend the gains, we have to actually maintain our movement. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah, and I, I, like, we can talk about it, but I think, like, Stain Revolution was a huge yeah. from Lenin that taught me, like, not only like what it actually what the state is, but like mm -hmm. how to use it for the liberation of my people. You know, it's not like the abstract enemy always, but to understand like the class character of the state is what we're fighting for. And that, yeah, you need every revolution that has won and has maintained its revolution has been done by a Democratic Centralist Party. And that's because they can defend it at the end of the day. Because you're gonna have betrayal, you're going to have the enemy coming at your doorstep, mm -hmm. you're going to have fractions within the party if it's not unified, if it's not um, like structured in that way. And that's a huge, you know, there's another great book that's kind of in the same vein of Lenin and it's called A Red Star for the Third World by Vijay Prashad and it okay. talks about, <laughs> it talks about like how important the Soviet Union was for you know, liberation movements around the world and how much support it provided and how much it was like a bulwark against the United States. And to have had the, the USSR fall, I mean, as Fidel said, it was one of the great, you know, tragedies of, of right. modern history. Um, and so we need to have that mindset of like, how do we win these things and then protect them? Because it doesn't matter if I get rights tomorrow and then a month later they're gone, you right. know? No, I think that's a really important point. It kind of connects back to this point about the state and about the police that you were making. Mm -hmm. You know, as we mentioned, like we are up against a centralized enemy. Yeah. It, is an app it is an entire apparatus that has wing, like all different wings mm -hmm. working <laughs> in different ways to keep the dictatorship of the rich mm. over the rest of us, a very small uh, you know, group of rich people who are enacting a dictatorship over the rest of us, you know, using the police as the armed wing of the state, mm. you know, using these institutions like universities mm. and mm -hmm. other educational institutions to indoctrinate us in mm. certain ways and, and how we think about and how we present ourselves mm -hmm. within our society. Um, and obviously, you know, we have like the government and, mm -hmm. you know, the way that the laws are set up, like mm. the laws, crime, uh -oh. is a social, <laughs> social construction. Yeah. We don't need to get into that conversation. Right? <laughs> but I think the point that you're making is, you know, we have we have a state right now um, mm -hmm. of, you know, the ruling class, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. I don't really like that term all that much, but the ruling class. And in order to have a revolution, as Lenin taught us, we need to have a revolution to overturn this state that we live under, but we need a state that can also protect the gains mm -hmm. and the wins uh, of our revolutionary movement, right? Mm -hmm. And Lenin calls that the dictatorship of the proletariat. Mm -hmm. And I think that term dictator is, you know, a spicy, a dicey term <laughs> to be using, yeah. but ultimately that's what we live under right now, whether right. we want whether we understand it or not. A dictatorship and of the rich. Exactly, like you said. exactly. But we actually need a dictatorship of working class people mm -hmm. who can say, nah, B, this is our <laughs> state now. This right. is our society. And there's going to be people who are going to come for our, the, our wins. Mm -hmm. They're going to say that, you know, this is 
this is a dictatorship, mm. whatever. They're going to say that, you know, this isn't a sustainable thing, you know, have all of their attacks against us and against our, our revolutionary movement. But ultimately, it's only the dictatorship of the proletariat, the ruling state power of the working class that's mm. going to secure and de- be able to allow us to, to defend our gains, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, I think this is a really important point because especially with like the whole 2020 situation, you know, people were like, abolish the police, abolish right. the prisons. And I feel like what was missing for a lot of folks was an understanding of what is the state, mm-hmm. which Lenin really, he really <laughs> <laughs> gives it to us good. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so with with state and revolution, that was one of one of the first like works of, of Lenin that I actually read in its entirety. <laughs> um, <laughs> And something that I would love to just read again with mm-hmm. comrades. Exactly. And just, you have to go yeah, back because you, you can get it one time, but then you no. go back and you start to. <laughs> like, oh, I didn't understand that at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And I genuinely had, I can say, I did not know what the state was before I read that. Mm. Like, I had no idea what people meant when they said the state. And I think people mean different things. But in Lenin's conception, he's talking about the the special body of armed people Mm. and the structures that essentially allow one class to dominate over another, right? Mm -hmm. So the bourgeois state, the owning class state, Mm -hmm. the capitalist state, like, Mm. you know, those are synonyms. That state is used to oppress the workers Mm. and maintain the power of the bourgeois class, the right. people who own businesses, Jeff Bezos types, mm-hmm. you know, Elon yeah, Musk types. Not the people who own their little No, houses, right. Little no, house. not the small time landlord. Like, that's not the person we're talking about. Right. Like, we're talking about people who own the means of production, who mm. own the factories, they own the land, you know, they mm-hmm. are, they own the, like, my, they, they own, own everything. They own everything, right? <laughs> they own everything and we own, we own nothing. nothing but <laughs> our ability to work. That's right. all we have for ourselves. So, understanding like what is the state when we say you know the state is made up of the prisons Mm. the courts the Mm -hmm. constitution the military Mm -hmm. the police right and those structures those systems the constitution that document is all used to set up this whole system Mm -hmm. and maintain this whole system and make sure that the workers stay oppressed and keep getting exploited and the ruling class keeps living off of our labor essentially Mm. and so i feel like You know, when we're talking about overthrowing the current state that we have and establishing a different kind of state, a Mm. worker state, some people are like, they there's this like concern, and Mm. I feel like the concern usually arises when it's black people, Asian people, like you know, Latin Americans who are controlling their own their own state, their own Mm. government, their own society, right? It's like, whoa, 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 that's authoritarianism. Mm, Like, they're, like, doing something wrong over there. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm going down a long hole. But I do feel like having an understanding of the state allows us to understand, well, when we overthrow the current... (laughs) When we overthrow the current, you know, ruling class... Uh, when we, you know, destroy when. this constitution <laughs> and all these other things in that process, like, what are we going to do with mm. all of the capitalists that and the police that are like killing kids in the street? Mm-hmm. You know, wh- what are we going to do with the people who are like abusing our community with no like they're with with impunity? Right. Mm-hmm. Like police can just shoot wherever. And mm-hmm. like, you know, people are like pe- people who are experiencing domestic abuse or violence or sexual harassment on the job like there is not really a reliable process Mm -mm. that we have to protect each other Mm -hmm. right now and so some of those people under the worker state are going to be thrown into prisons that exist under the worker state right and the ultimate goal is to not have to have this kind of like society Mm. but at the same time like we as workers when we do have control over the state it allows us to then stop and repress the ruling, the former ruling class, the mm. bourgeois class, the owning class, the reactionaries mm. from coming back and basically trying to reestablish the kind of society that we have now. Mm-hmm. So right, it's no way yeah. they're going to take power. And they're going to be like, okay, guys, cool. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. it's your turn. When has that happened ever in history? Mm-hmm. Never. The, the things that the ruling class, the global ruling class has inflicted on the working class, the people, the peasantry, the, the you know, the farmers, the rural workers, like for centuries, 
like the masses are going to want some kind of reparations oh, 100%. and like that is like the that that is what the people are going to want like mm-hmm. we we actively need to repress these forces to defend what we have but also i mean like we're seeing it now with gaza like these people have no regard mm. for the lives of everybody else mm. in this world. They have no regard for the visuals that we get every day, for the destruction of refugee camps, hospitals, schools. Like, it's so unhuman, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. the way that, that the rich operate and think about the world that there's, you know, it's, it's a fantasy to think that revolution will happen, we'll have, you know, a socialist world, and, and nobody's, and everybody's going to be like, oh, yeah, we should, you know, we should keep the, we should get rid of these prisons. That's fine. Right. Like, the people are not going to want that. That's not realistic. And so I think right. that that's, like, what you were saying to that. I mean, that's why we say jail killer cops. Right, and, that one. And that's why all the families <laughs> yeah. who talk about wanting justice for their family members say, lock them up yeah you know like i need ju- justice to me looks like locking up these police officers who kill our family members our community members with impunity mm-hmm. you know and i think the the co- the contestations whatever the word is against that slogan just are not rooted in the facts of where the working class is you're yeah. not mm-hmm. out there in the streets struggling alongside these families mm-hmm. to know what they actually want mm-hmm. you know because as we were kind of getting into, right, it's like working class people are thrown in jail for nothing, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's like these cops kill someone with absolutely no basis for doing so. And they're like... Pay time off. Pay time Mm -hmm. off. Like, what? You know, they can go get a job in another city and they do the same thing Mm -hmm. to another family. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, what we have in our society is what justice looks like is for them to have the same repercussions as working class people have for things that are... Far less, Mm -hmm. you know? It's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. But Mia, so me and Gabby kind of talked about, so (laughs) I'm wrestling communism out here. That's that's my original (laughs) one. Gabby has state and revolution, you know, as a, well. My first, that was the first one that I read. (laughs) The first one that, the first book that introduced me to Lenin was imperialism in the 21st mm-hmm. century okay. i know it was it started off with a heavy hitter okay <laughs> like i was like all right we're, we're getting into it um and it was a collective study it was when i was first joining the party Ooh. honestly i was like we do we really <laughs> we really love a collective study because i was like okay first of all these people are reading together like this isn't even like a formal school setting it, it was genuinely mm. it was genuinely I don't, I don't even know like it just felt very welcoming right mm-hmm. like these are some big words, you know. I don't understand everything that's going on. I'm new to this whole space, mm. but here are these organizers that are like, what do you think about right. <laughs> war? You and have that, things to say. Yeah, yeah, and especially being, you know, growing up and in the United States and for all of my life, the United States has been in war, mm-hmm. right? And once that, once that was conceptualized to me, like posed to me as a question of like why that is, mm. I was like, okay, like Lenin, like in the context of imperialism in the 21st century, I was like, wow, like, this is, this is just deep, you Mm. know? It's like, (laughs) people are getting, not, I mean, like, people are getting bombed every Mm. day, right? Like, yeah, it's crazy. We saw, like, just this past week, the US, UK, airstrikes on Yemen, Mm -hmm. one of the poorest countries in the world. A month ago, the Biden administration was like, Oh, you know, the humanitarian crisis is really bad. You know, we're issuing all these, you know, State Department, like, emails and statements. And now, okay, so, but you have no problem bombing the country. It's like, how much that airstrike costs? Yeah. Cancel the loans. (laughs) Cancel the debt. Right. Worry about the wrong thing. Yeah. No, imperialism was my first Lenin text also. Okay. And it was... That's a heavy hitter first one Mm -hmm. but it's like people have all these you know i feel really strongly that young people and i know this might be hard for somebody here but you (laughs) should not really i think i firmly believe that one should not use words that they don't understand Mm. and so i was like imperialism everybody's talking about it i want to talk about it let me read this Mm. book it's called imperialism i'll just read it (laughs) and it you like when you read it with people who are organizing when you read it collectively you see like oh this is really this is like this could have been written maybe not today but this could have been written like 
a hundred years after Lenin mm-hmm. wrote it. Like this is so sharp and so accurate to how th- I feel like the world works mm-hmm. and gave me so much clarity and like it's really like liberating to see the world in that way actually but becomes so clear that like damn I'm I'm we live in this world that's so demoralizing in a lot of ways like mm-hmm. it feels like the US has just like you said, just destroys with impunity, destroys mm-hmm. countries, levels cities, you know, represses and, you know, set, like is leading this sort of, you know, financial economic structure that keeps people in debt, keeps people in mm-hmm. global poverty. And that's, a, that's like, you know, I think anybody who has family who's from like that part of the world feels like such a deep injustice that Mm. that people live like that around the world and I think that the words of Lenin really spoke to that part of my identity that was like I'm pissed for what my mom had to go through I'm Mm -hmm. so pissed off that she had to live like that that she had to go through what she did that she has to to survive with the experiences that she has and I want to I want to you know, I want justice mm-hmm. for these people. I want justice for all of these people who have who have not only struggled today, but the people who are part of our movement who have died right. uh, from, you know, from struggle, but also just like, you know, if you think about like famine mm-hmm. or war across the world, like you think about the endless wars that the U.S. goes to, and for what? And mm-hmm. millions of people die in those wars. And... I think that Lenin's understanding of imperialism and the, the characteristics of it are so important for all of us to learn because if you feel like that, if you feel called to action in that way, like he's giving you the tools to say, you know what, like if I want to liberate, you know, my family who's from Bangladesh or if I want to liberate my family who's who's from India or from for me, like from Vietnam, and they already had their revolution and I'll, we can talk about that later, but like <laughs> you need to follow the words of Lenin, not because he was alone, but because he was leading, you know, revolutionary parties from Mexico, Mm -hmm. from Iran, from all around the world who looked to Lenin and said, I see in that man and his words and his ideas a way to liberate my people, Mm -hmm. which is like so powerful. And we, for some reason, the U.S. think that we don't have to read that, don't have to learn that history, we don't need to follow in that. I just, yeah, I just don't understand sometimes how people can feel like that, but I I really feel strongly about Lenin in that way. Right, well, it's because I think it's so easy, especially, like, as young people of color, to be like, well, that's just a white dude Mm. from Russia. Like, same with Marx, it's like, you know, a white dude. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, what does he have to say? But it's actually, he contributed to our revolutionary movement, the theory around Mm self-determination for nations, Mm. which is so, so important. I mean, and just to back up a little bit, you said we don't want to use words that we don't understand. Lenin, Lenin described imperialism. He contributed the theory that imperialism is the highest stage Mm. of capitalism, Mm -hmm. right? So basically what that means is that, I mean, if we really, really simplify, it's like (laughs) capitalism globalize mm. you know it's it's capitalism searching for new markets mm. around the globe mm-hmm. and exploiting the hell out of them until some guy in an office probably in the united states mm-hmm. or not he's not even in an office because he's not working <laughs> some guy in on a jet on a vacation on an island mm-hmm. getting his bank account going up and up and up because he's able to exploit some factory some market whatever mm-hmm. in some other place across the globe and lenin really told us that imperialism being the highest stage of capitalism we need a revolution to overthrow capitalism mm. in order to see any liberation for our people to see liberation for our people across the globe um, to have self-determination for for nations all around the globe mm-hmm. um, and see things like black liberation, right? Mm-hmm. Which we know is fundamental to the fight against capitalism. And being in the United States, again, the culprit of world capitalism, <laughs> the culprit of imperialism. Yeah. That's ex- it's It's like Lenin really put it all in a nice package <laughs> with a bow for us. He said... We need to defeat imperialism. We need to defeat capitalism. And we need a revolutionary party Mm. to do it. So I feel like today a lot of people 
you know, are thinking of you know, we're hearing imperialism a lot in social on social media, in maybe not on mainstream media, but folks are starting to have this conversation about imperialism. Mm. And one thing that Lenin teaches us through imperialism is that, you know, capitalism is a system. Mm. Imperialism is a system. It's not just like a policy of like, oh, you know, this president or that president mm. decides whether mm -hmm. or not they're going to go into war. It's like, no, mm -hmm. the capitalist class is mm -hmm. trying to dominate the world mm -hmm. and redivide the world, maintain their hegemony. And so that requires, like, that breeds war, right? Mm -hmm, right. And so that breeds the 800, over 800, almost 1,000 base, military bases the U.S. Mm -hmm. has around the world. Mm -hmm. It's the reason why they're propping up Israel in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And it's the reason, like, Israel wouldn't be able to do anything or carry mm -hmm. out a genocide, much less, you know, survive in this, you know, colonial, settler colonial project without mm -hmm. sponsorship, complete backing by mm -hmm. the United States. And so when Lenin was writing imperialism, he was thinking about, you know, the early stages of, mm -hmm. of like this transition to global, a globalized capitalist system. Mm -hmm. And it was in the context of ending war, mm -hmm. a world war. And so mm -hmm. for us today, people know, like, Working class people feel, mm. in addition to the endless wars that we're in, Ukraine, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, China, mm -hmm. like the, the, the demonization of China and the pivot to Asia and just mm -hmm. how the United States is still entrenched in wars in the Middle East, not mm -hmm. just in propping up Israel, but all around the Middle East. And then mm -hmm. they're worried about their oil. Mm -hmm. So now they're airstriking Yemen, the only, like one of the only countries, the country who is doing the most mm -hmm. materially to support Palestine. Mm -hmm. So I think just to bring it back, like for us today, if we're serious about uh, uh, serious about the question of Palestinian liberation mm -hmm. and how we in the U.S. can truly be a part of the fight for the liberation of Palestinians and all people from the, ourselves included from the scourge of war, then we need to understand like, okay, I'm not rooting for the United States mm. government. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm simply not. Right. And that was the, that was the unpopular opinion mm. that Lenin right. held and maintained mm -hmm. under threat of death, execution, yep. exile, mm -hmm. actually being exiled. And so I just feel like, a, he's so real for that. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> he's so real. And B, he's also proved, like it was proven through history mm -hmm. that in order to defeat imperialism, if you want to defeat capitalism, we have to overthrow this system and mm -hmm. establish a different one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we need a revolutionary party to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, okay, I'm going to, it's kind of nerdy. Oh, she got a book right. out. Okay, but. Okay. But I feel like the, oh. like one of my, obviously one of my favorite revolutionaries is Ho Chi Minh yeah. because the Vietnamese defeated mm. three imperialist powers, okay. the French, Japanese, the United States. Okay. They went to war for almost 30 years. They came out with a socialist future, but like, the 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 uh, it makes me really proud to be Vietnamese above oh, all. Like yeah. this is my people's culture, which is defeating the enemy. I know that's <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, but I think that like Ho Chi Minh, and this is like pretty rare. I feel like that you get this kind of like personal look into a revolutionary's life. But he talks about reading Lenin. He says. He says, what emotion, enthusiasm, clear-sightedness, and confidence it instilled to me. I was overjoyed to tears. Though sitting alone in my room, I shouted aloud as if addressing large crowds. Dear martyrs, compatriots, this is what we need, and this is the path to revolution. Leninism is not only a miraculous book of the wise, but a compass for Vietnamese revolutionaries and people. It is also the radiant sun illuminating our path to final victory to socialism and communism. Hell yes. yeah. Like so I love that. Fire. And you just know, like, the theory of self-determination that Lenin introduced to Marxism, which is why it's, you know, we are a Marxist-Leninist party, mm -hmm. is so essential to understanding what a new, not only overthrowing global capitalism, but what like a new world will look like. Mm -hmm. How are we gonna deal with, you know, we think about the USSR and, and the self-determination of the different nationalities within that region. Mm -hmm. Like how are we gonna build yeah. a new state that recognizes national oppression within the borders that we have now? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like, it's guided, it's guided our party. I mean, we understand Without question, every single PSL member understands, without even a thought of doubt, 
the Palestinian liberation will be is inevitable and will be done by Palestinians. We don't want, I mean, that's the slogan. We don't want no two state. We don't want any capitulation. We want the Palestinian people to lead and, you know, create their own state and govern their own state. And that's what we want. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going to be tricked by liberals Mm -hmm. or by capitulation. Like we know clearly step by step, you know, what that looks like. And that's just like the application of Lenin's self-determination in practice. Mm-hmm. And it le- leads us to know that like, okay, October 7th, October 8th, we're coming out yeah. with the, the clear political line. And we're not gonna say, oh, you know, we're not gonna condemn Hamas because we know scientifically, you know, like what it means to support Palestinian resistance. Right. Right. And we're gonna be really clear about what you have to say. What's your favorite revolutionary? <laughs> Tell us. My favorite revolutionary comes from the iconic Black Panther Party, <laughs> who many, many, I think today is becoming more popularly recognized mm-hmm. that the Black Panthers were, were a Marxist Leninist party. Right. But this definitely, you know, the image of the Black Panther Party has, you know, I think gone through many phases mm. in US history. Obviously, they were demonized at their inception and their start. Um, and even for a long time after, I think it just, mm. it just goes to show this, there's a playbook for, mm-hmm. you know, the, our enemies, you know, like mm-hmm. the ruling class. They demonize our leadership. They call us terrorists. They call us, you know, um, less than human mm-hmm. and all of these things. And so anyways, when I was an early in my political journey, I read Asada by Asada mm. Shakur. <laughs> you know, know, you know we love us some Asada, okay? <laughs> like changing. she in her autobiography, there is a quote, and I'm not gonna quote it perfectly. Maybe Rachel can help me out with it, but she just talks about how she was encouraged to read Marx and Lenin and Engels, but she didn't really want to read them. She was like, I'd rather read Ho Chi Minh mm-hmm. or I think Fidel. Fidel, you know, which like also read Ho Chi Minh and Fidel. Like, mm-hmm. hell yeah. Um, and then she said, well, in order to really understand what Huey Newton was saying in any of his speeches, I had to go back and read Lenin and exactly. Marx and Engels. And so it really is just giving like your favorite's favorite is <laughs> Lenin. Love, like, <laughs> like, believe it, you know, exactly. like same with Nina Simone, mm-hmm. right? She has a quote right. where she's like, you know, real's girl, real girls talk wasn't men in clothes. It was Marx and Lenin. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, ah, that's where we're at. So, <laughs> yeah. So I just feel like, you know, my black women revolutionaries holding me down, oh, keeping yeah. me inspired mm-hmm. and, you know, Lenin, another revolutionary. It's like we're gonna we're gonna get all the tools we can get. Mm-hmm, it, I, right. Like you were saying in the beginning, it's not about identity politics, right? Mm-hmm. Like if if you're gonna be on some John Brown energy <laughs> and you're ready to raid <laughs> the very like let's get to it then. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but that's my favorite revolutionary. No, mm-hmm. I think like what y'all are saying demonstrates exactly how pertinent Lenin was and has been to global movements for liberation literally everywhere um i knew you were gonna say asada she's also one of my favorite (laughs) revolutionaries and so i have to shout out my girl claudia jones also a leninist yes from trinidad Mm -hmm. from the caribbean organizing in the united states and she joined the communist party of the u.s Mm -hmm. of a because she knew (laughs) that (laughs) because she knew that they were upholding the principles of Marx and Lenin, mm-hmm. right? Like particularly on that point of self-determination mm-hmm. and understanding the, the the Black Belt thesis, you know, mm. Harry Haywood's Black Belt yep. thesis and contribution to the na- understanding the quote unquote national question, um, AKA, you know, the theory on Black liberation mm-hmm. in the United mm-hmm. States was fundamental to mm-hmm. know, you know, to the, the Communist Party organizing. It was like a monumental development. Mm-hmm. And Claudia Jones understood that that self-determination is so important for black people to be liberated and also for women to be liberated, yeah. right? Because, you know, as you mentioned earlier, Gabby, it's like women in the Soviet Union were the first to get mm-hmm. abortion rights. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, we're here in the quote unquote most developed, Uh-oh. most whatever, democratic, whatever the hell they want to say every other week right. about country in the, in the world. And we don't even have enshrined abortion rights like mm. federally. It's, it's pretty ridiculous. There's a point that's being made around like being in a revolutionary party, but I also feel like we should encourage people to be in 
organization. Like I feel yeah. like it's better it's better to be in an organization, even if it's not a Leninist formation, than mm-hmm. to just be out here on your own and mm-hmm. not connected with people in the masses, right? Like mm-hmm. organizations come and go. Yeah. Hopefully they stay <laughs> and, and last. But like a lot of formations, a lot of organizations do just they pop up and then a few years, a few months, a few days, they they dissipate and that's mm-hmm. okay. A few days. I mean, sometimes it's, sometimes the group chat falls apart. Like, I don't know what to say. Um, but you know, I think that the goal is to, like, mm-hmm. from wherever we are, just understand the role of a revolutionary party, which mm-hmm. I think does have a very specific and particular role, right? Like, not not everyone is gonna be in a revolutionary party when the revolution happens, right? Mm-hmm. It wasn't like every Russian was a Bolshevik, right? But there were these de- this extremely dedicated group of cadre that were mm-hmm. with the masses fully coming from many different aspects of society who were deeply entrenched in that and understood you know, their role and how to relate to the masses. Mm-hmm. So. so this has been great. <laughs> I We need to do this more often. Yeah. <laughs> we need the real red table talk. Uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry, Jada, but this is the real deal right here. <laughs> So in the spirit of honoring Lenin in 100 years since his passing, we need to continue to uplift the importance, the relevance of studying Lenin, reading Lenin, and actually putting it into practice. Yes. Mm. So get involved, get outside, and we will see you in the streets. Hey! <laughs>